Hi everyone. So in this video, we're going to talk about three things. First one's going to be how to find concavity, how to find your points of inflection, and then the second derivative test. Now, to find concavity and points of inflection, we're going to use two problems. The first one's just a basic polynomial equation, and the one after it is a rational function. So we're going to go ahead and get started. Anytime that you see a question that asks you to find your intervals of concavity, you want to be able to find your second derivative. So the first thing is, well, you got to be able to find your first derivative, which gives you 3x squared minus 12x plus 12. Now, once you find your first derivative, go ahead and find your second derivative. So you get 6x minus 12. Now, concavity are the same exact steps that you did for increasing and decreasing. You first find your derivative, then find your second derivative. Now, set this equal to zero. Because what you want to do is you want to find out when your sec second derivative is going to equal zero. So pretty much you find your critical numbers. So solve for x, you get 6x is equal to 12, and then x is equal to 2. That means that x equals 2 that is a critical number. So this, just like you did in your first derivative, you're going to put 2 on a number line. And you're going to test values. A number less than 2, 0. A number greater than 2, 3. Then your next step is the same exact thing that you did in your first derivative. Plug in 0 into your second derivative. The reason why we need to plug zero into our second derivative is because we're dealing with concavity. Whenever you want to see whether something is concave up or concave down, you have to be able to plug into the derivative that you're working with. So since we're working with our second derivative, we're going to plug zero into our second derivative. So if you plug in zero, you're going to get a negative number. When you get a negative value, that means that your graph is concave down. So it's going to create a U shape facing downward. Then you're going to plug in three into your second derivative and that's going to give you a positive number which tells you it's going to be concave up. So by finding your second derivative, setting your derivative equal to zero, then find your critical numbers, plugging them on a number line, testing the value left and right, and plugging them into your second derivative, you're going to be able to determine your intervals of concavity. So for this equation, you're going to have a concave down from negative infinity to 2, concave up from 2 to infinity. Now, the way we find the point of inflection, which you'll tend to see it as POI, the way you find a point of inflection is if your concavity is changing from concave upward to downward, downward to upward. So when you have a change in concavity, that's when you have a point of inflection. So if you look at this example, it's downward then upward. So that means at x equals 2, you have a point of inflection. So you could put 2 comma, the question is what are we going to put in here? So because we're trying to find a real point, you're going to plug in 2 into your original equation. And when you plug in 2 into your original equation, you are going to get 8. And that means that we have a point of inflection at 2 comma 8. So the only time that you're ever going to have a point of inflection is if you see your intervals changing from concave upward to downward, downward to upward. Now, don't forget that at this number, it can't be a vertical asymptote. The second this is a vertical asymptote, you can't have a point of inflection. In this case, you actually get a real point, so that means your point of inflection is at 2 comma 8. All right, so now we're going to work on our next example. f of x equals 2, 4 over x minus 2. Now, for most, this is a little bit more of a trouble type of problem because you actually have to find two type of derivatives. Your first derivative, then your second derivative. Now, a lot of us may want to do quotient rule because you see a fraction, so you, you think that quotient rule is going to be the easiest method. Actually, anytime you have a number on top by itself, it's easier to put this in parentheses, raise it to the first power, and bring it up so that you have 4 over 
sorry, 4x minus 2 raised to the negative first power, because since you brought it up, it's going to be raised to the negative first power. Now, when you have this type of equation, well, it's actually not product rule because there's no variable with the 4. It's just a basic chain rule where you take this negative 1, multiply it with the 4 to get negative 4 parentheses. This inside stays the same. Subtract the x1 by, two, by 1, so you get negative 2. Then find the derivative of this, which is just 1. Multiply your first and the last, you get negative 4 x minus 2 to negative 2, and that's your first derivative. Now, I can go ahead and simplify by bringing this, this uh, negative 2 down, but the problem is I'm, my goal is to find my second derivative. So if they're asking me for intervals of concavity, I don't really care about simplifying my first derivative. So now I'm going to look at this, and what do I have to do to find my second derivative? Well, maybe I should do product rule, but the thing is there's no variable next to this 4, so automatically I know it's just another chain rule. So I'm going to multiply this negative 4 with this negative 2. I'm going to get a positive 8, keep the inside the same subtract 1 from the exponent, you get to the negative third. Now, once I find my derivative, and then I can do a chain rule as well, the derivative of this is just 1 again, so this is just going to give me 8x minus 2 raised to the negative third. Now once I get here, and I already found my derivative, this is when I want to simplify, because I want to be able to set the top equal to 0 and set the bottom equal to 0. So I have 8 over x minus 2 to the third power, and this is my second derivative. So once I have my second derivative, well anytime you want to find critical numbers for a rational equation, you have to set the top equal to 0 and set the bottom equal to 0. So if I go ahead and set the top equal to 0, I get 8 equals 0, which I can't really solve for x, and also 8 is not equal to 0, so that's not true. So that means there's no critical numbers for the top. So now I'm going to set the bottom equal to 0. x minus 2 equals to 0, x equals to 2. So that means my only critical number is at x equals 2. So now once I have my critical number, this is when I want to put on a number line. Check, plug in a number that's left of it, any number, 0, a number right of it, 3. Now don't forget, because we're plugging into, we're working with our second derivative because it tells us concavity, we have to plug in these values into your second derivative. So if you plug 0 into here, you're going to get 0 minus 2, which is negative 2. Negative 2 to the third power is still going to be negative and a positive over a negative will give you a negative. So that means that any value between negative infinity to 2 is negative, meaning it's concave down. Then you're going to do the same exact thing for 3. Plug in 3 into your second derivative. 3 minus 2 is positive. Positive raised to the third is still positive. Positive over positive is a positive. That means that it's concave up. So now you have concave down from negative infinity to 2 and then you have concave up from 2 to infinity. So these are your intervals of concavity. Now, the question might ask, well, try to find that point of inflection. And because the definition of a point of inflection says there actually is a point of inflection when concavity changes, you might think, oh, well, there's a point of inflection at 2. But the problem is, 2 happens to be the same exact vertical asymptote of your original equation. So if we go back to the original equation, if I were to set the bottom equal to 0, because that's how you find your VAs, you're going to set the bottom equal to 0, and you're going to get x is equal to 2. Now, because you got a vertical asymptote at x equals 2, that means you cannot have a point of inflection at that point. You cannot have anything, because there's no real point on x equals 2, because that's your vertical asymptote. So, because of that, there actually isn't any point of inflection. Now in the case that maybe you forget that and you forgot to check to see if there's a vertical asymptote, what you could do is remember, anytime you want to actually find the point of inflection, you can plug in that 2 where that change occurred into your original equation. So if you plugged in f of 2 to get 4 over 2 minus 2, you're going to notice that this is going to give you 4 over 0. Now the second you get 4 over 0, that's going to give you undefined or an error when you plug into your calculator. That's because you can never have a 0 on the bottom, therefore there is no point of inflection. So in the case that we happen to forget that you can't have a point of inflection in a vertical asymptote, and you happen to plug it in, anytime you get a number over 0, it means that it's undefined, which means no point of inflection. Okay. 
So when you're dealing with concavity, make sure you work with your second derivative and plug all these values that when, you t when you're testing into your second derivative. And if you do happen to have a point of inflection, plug it into your original equation because it's a real point. So now this is going to get us to our last example. How to work with the second derivative test. The second derivative test is just used to help us find whether or not we have a max or a min at that critical number. So the first thing we need to do is we need to find the first derivative. So if we find the first derivative of this equation, you're going to get f prime of x is equal to 6x squared plus 6x minus 12. And then like always, you need to find your critical numbers. So you're going to set the derivative equal to 0. Factor out a 6 because I have three terms and they all have a common 6. Factor it out. Set them all equal to 0. You get x equals to negative 2 and x equals to 1. So that means if you wanted to actually have a critical number, or if you wanted to find the max or min, that means a max or a min would only occur at these critical numbers. So your second derivative test is actually just asking you to determine whether or not you're going to have a max or a min at these critical numbers of your first derivative. So what you're going to do, what it asks you to do is once you find your critical numbers, they want you to find your second derivative. So if I have my first derivative here, if I find my second derivative, I'm going to get f double prime is equal to 12x plus 6. Now what it's saying is if I plug in my critical numbers in which I'm actually going to plug it in so you're going to get 12 times negative 2 plus 6 which is going to give you to negative 18. If you get a value when you plug in your critical number so if you plug in your critical number and you get a value that's less than zero, what that means is you have a max at x equals to c, meaning at that critical number you have a max. Now if you get a value that's greater than zero, that means you have a min at x equals to c. Now in the beginning this is going to be a little confusing because well if it's less than zero how's that a max and if it's greater than zero how's that a min? It's one of those theorems that you just have to memorize. Calculus has a lot of theorems that you just have to know and memorize. So when you plug in your critical numbers into your second derivative and it happens to be less than, well what that means if it's less than zero, that means you have a max at x is equal to negative two. Now let's say I wanted to actually try my plugging in one, my second critical number. I'm gonna get 12 times one plus 6 and that's going to give me to 18. Well I notice that 18 is greater than 0. So greater than 0 means that I have a min at x is equal to 1. So your second derivative test is actually just finding out whether or not you have a max or a min at your critical values of your first derivative. But the first thing that you have to do is you have to First, find your critical numbers. Set your critical numbers, set your derivative equal to zero so that you can find your critical numbers, and then plug in these critical numbers into your second derivative. If you get a value that's less than zero, it's a max. If you get a value that's greater than zero, it's a min. Now, in the case where your second derivative, when you plug in your critical numbers, it equals to zero, it means that there's nothing. It's just a critical number for your second derivative because when you set your derivative equal to zero, that t is going to give you a critical number. So it doesn't really mean anything. Okay? So once again, to find to apply the second derivative test, first find your derivative set equal to zero, then find your second derivative, plug in that critical number that you found for your first derivative, plug them into your second derivative. If you get a value that's less than zero, it's a max. If you get a value that's greater than zero, it's a min. And if you get a number that's equal to zero, then it just means that there's nothing. There's no max or min because it's a critical number of your second derivative. And that's how you apply the second derivative test. All right, guys, hope this helped. Good luck.